Often, when science wants to get to the bottom of a mystery, it starts by looking extremely closely at something. Now, there's evidence that the microscope was invented back in the 13th century, and even Galileo's version in the 1600s could only magnify about 30 times. So, how close can we get nowadays? Well, if you're just using lenses, then the maximum amount of magnification is around about one and a half thousand times, which means that the smallest object you can see is about 200 nanometers across, or the size of the smallest bacteria. What if you want to look at something smaller? like a virus, so HIV or rabies, or protein curled up in a cell, or even a single atom. Well, it turns out that in order to look at something very, very small, you have to go to somewhere very, very large. This is Mark. Mark is a senior software scientist at Diamond Light Source. Correct, That's correct. Yeah. It is. And I did a film with uh, Edge before looking at how the electrons are actually accelerated around the ring, which I learned was not a ring. It is an irregular tetra chi octagon. I go with that, yeah. I think. Um, but what Mark's going to tell us all about is how the scientists use all that energy that's released to actually look at things that are very, very tiny. Because why can't we look at things that are smaller than 200 nanometers across if we're using lenses and visible light? The wavelength is just too long for us to be able to see really small things. Gotcha. So small wavelengths allows us to see small objects. You guys might know about the electromagnetic spectrum. So we've got visible light in the middle, which runs from red, orange, yellow, green, indigo, blue, violet to here. So blue, violet down that end. Um, this is longer wavelength, shorter wavelength. If you go even longer, you get to infrared and up. And if you go shorter, then you get X-rays and down to gamma, etc. Yeah. So what they produce here is everything from kind of infrared down to yeah, all the way through visible right? light as well. It's just we don't generally use that because there's other ways of producing. Because yeah, we can light. just use a microscope. So why do you need smaller wavelengths to look at smaller things? So if you think about a stick, if you put a stick in the beach mm -hmm. and let waves from the sea roll over it, mm -hmm. then those will effectively just go straight round it, and you'll barely notice any difference in the wave afterwards. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you take the same stick and put it in a duck pond and then drop a stone in you get lots of nice little small ripples, small wavelength, and you'll see the stick. It will start making additional patterns. So I've got a bit of an experiment that I can show you if you'd like to participate. I was a little bit worried about all the stuff that we, I'm seeing here. Yeah, we've got a few components. So i uh, just like to put on this protective suit. Put on do this you, protective suit, he do you, says. Do you know what? Maybe, maybe two would be good. What? Oh no, I've made a hole. You definitely need to do two then. Somebody should really see to that squeak. <laughs> right, I'm protected. Two suits, Excellent. eye protection. Perfect. So if you'd just like to take a lie down on my experimental board, and what we're going to try and do is we're going to try and take a, a picture of you using as few photons as, as we can. Yeah, just drizzle right across me like I'm, uh, you know, a pudding or something. So what Mark's trying to do is take an image of me on the board, and we're starting with a low amount of light. Thick paint. <laughs> equals low light. Yeah, that, that works. <laughs> um, so shall I peel off and see what we got? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, it's a Picasso. I mean, we could probably put that in the Tate Modern and sell it for quite a lot of money. So not much light, i.e. not much paint, not much detail. Yeah, absolutely. Got it. So I think we can do better than this. Although that was a beautiful picture, if we use more paint slash light, we can get an even better picture. It's quite nice to have a lie down. Can I stand up yet, Mark? Here we go. Beautiful. Oh, that's better. OK, good. So I'm getting the idea. Yeah. Getting the idea. More light, more paint. You've showed it perfect. Perfect. So what we need now is uh, more paint. OK. <laughs> Doing this for science. You guys having fun? Yeah. Yeah. Underneath me right now are electrons flying along at close to the speed of light. Is this similar to what goes on here? Yeah, this is remarkably similar. So you're playing the part of a sample. Uh, and what the people spraying you with paint are doing is playing the part of all of the uh, photons that are going to be hitting that sample or moving past that sample and leaving us an imprint of what it looks like. What do you call this process? Uh, covering someone in paint. <laughs> this is kind of like absorption tomography or absorption imaging. So you're absorbing the paint rather than letting it hit the detector, which is this board beneath you. If we were to then slowly rotate you, collect thousands of images onto boards like this, then we could make up a, a 3D model of what you actually look like. Gotcha. Uh, where's Mark? I'm over here. Okay. Would you like a hand up? I think we've got a good image of you now. Uh, I'm free. There we go. Look at that. I'd just like to say to YouTube, my bum is not that big. So Mark, I'm looking at the suit. Yep. And obviously there's paint. We kind of wrecked the suit, right? Yep. 
Do you wreck a sample doing this? But when we're looking at really, really tiny things, what we do is we freeze them down to stop all of the atoms wobbling around. If we'd frozen me, my bum wouldn't look this big. Absolutely. So this is one image of a tomography. As we said earlier, if we rotated you around, we could build up a 3D image. So this is a piece of coral. Oh, it's a 3D printout of a piece of coral. So it was originally embedded in a piece of rock. That when they started to try and remove the fossil, they started breaking it. Hmm. So what we did was we took the whole piece of rock, did a tomography of the entire thing at one of the stations at Diamond. We were able to see through, and then using a computer, we could extract the coral, 3D print it. This is about five times its normal size. And then the paleontologists were able to look at this, speciate it, work out exactly what type of fossil coral it was, and then because of the rock it was in, they could work out where it goes on the fossil record. Can I have a look at one of these thingies, these beam splitter pods where you do these images? Yeah, we can take you down to the beam line now. Thingies, that's not a very science word, is it? Beam. The beam line. The beam better. line. So this is it. This is the end of a beam line. So what happens is when the x-rays are produced, when they're yep. released, uh, they, they come off the side of the ring and they're focused, 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 and they come out there? Yep, that's it. It's so off, it's off. It is off, it's you're off. fine, you're fine. The beam comes out right at this point here and that's where it hits our sample. So essentially if the beam is our spray cans, you're the sample, you would be positioned right at the end there. Yep. And one of the nice things that we've got here is the robot. That is a cool robot. The robot is essentially doing my job, which was to position you in place so that we could collect the data on you. Yep. Uh, the great thing about that is the robot can work even though we've got x-rays going on in the room. So if we had to worry about basically changing the sample all the time, actually humans are too slow at doing that now. Okay. So we use the robot to do that nice and quickly. And it just shows you why, if you want to look at something very, very, very small, you need a very, 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 very large bit of kit. Yep. Mark, thanks so much. Oh, you're welcome. This is, this is why science is cool. Look at this kit. What a day. If I say particle accelerator, you probably think of the Large Hadron Collider in CERN, an epic 27 kilometer long loop inside which particles are smashed together to uncover the mysteries of the universe. 